Hey everybody, welcome to this month's WEN Talk. Today is March 16th, 2023. I am Haley Gray. I am the founder of the Women's Entrepreneur Network, where every month we do an event, a speaking event, where we do amazing, inspiring talks from six speakers every month except December, which is more. We do nine speakers in December. And we are here to inspire you and to have some fun together. So please give us a hello, give us a hi, give us some commentary, give us some chatter. Um, Treelin can actually see your comments. I can see your comments when you post them. Um, so feel free to comment and interact with us just a little bit. And each of our amazing speakers is here today to pour out and pour into you and share with you their amazing story. So I want you to encourage them and give them a huge round of applause for being here. And with that, I'm going to give our stage to the amazing, fantastic, fantabulous Creelan Peters. Welcome. Wow. I, thank you. I, I, I like, okay, I'm out, right? Like, I, I don't You're know here. how to follow that. Yeah. Uh, so thank you, Haley. Thanks so much for inviting me uh, to speak to uh, your group. Um, so my name is Creelan, and I am a psychotherapist, a coach, an educator, and a consultant, um, and obviously an entrepreneur as well. So uh, what I wanted to do today is kind of talk with you a little bit about um, my observations over the last three years, so since the pandemic began, because I'm kind of in a unique perspective to uh, see what's going on from kind of a bird's eye view. I've had a lot of different roles um, since the pandemic started, and I have some, I don't know, maybe some things to share that could be helpful. Um, and just kind of some, some themes that I've been seeing and how I've shifted some of the work that I have done with people um, that I work with, whether those are clients in my private practice, um, work teams that I work with around the country, um, or, or other people that I work with uh, through other things that I do. Um, so just a little bit about kind of the pandemic uh, when it first started and how things were kind of going. Um, I noticed, um, now I, I'm just going to be real here. So I was struggling a little bit myself. Um, well, probably a lot. Um, and and not, not only because we had this pandemic, but I at that time was doing uh, just contract work. So my uh, my money went away. And, and that was like a very obviously challenging uh, piece for me to have to deal with. I was doing uh, mostly uh, in-person on-site work and uh, that went away. So I had to pivot um, and I used uh, some tools that really helped me kind of deal with my own responses to not only financial loss, but other kinds of things that I was struggling with at the beginning of the pandemic, as I'm sure many of us were. Um, and I'm going to share those with you because those have really kind of helped uh, a lot of the people that I work with. And I love teaching how to kind of uh, work on, on those kinds of things. Um, so what I've also been able to do. Um, so quickly, I was able to reestablish and pivot um, to uh, find other sources of income and new ways of working with people. So I went to, uh, I went to mostly doing in-person work to online work, which has been a tremendous gift for me to be able to do and I can reach more people. Um, and so I have been able to do that through my private practice. Um, I was also um, doing, um, I was kind of recruited to do this position and run a, a part of a federal grant for the state of Arizona where I reside. And uh, we were tasked with helping people in Arizona deal with the psychological impact of the pandemic. So I kind of had that bird's eye view statewide here. Uh, we, re we did some individual work. I had a team working for me. Um, we did a lot of group work and education and outreach to people within the community, especially people who were very vulnerable uh, during that time. And uh, so that I learned a lot from that. And we had to build up programming around resilience and teach different skills. Um, another role that I've had that's been really helped me kind of shift the way that I work um, is doing consulting um, with work teams around the country. And this is for people um, who have experienced traumatic 
uh, loss, and that could be related to the pandemic. So uh, death losses uh, could be uh, traumatic injuries of people at the workplace. Um, gosh, mass shootings, um, a lot of stuff that you see in the news, whether it's local news or national news, um, I have been a part of things like that as well to kind of help people deal with the aftermath of those things. And so there's a lot of things that I'm kind of going over with people and teaching them in kind of how to deal with the impact of things, whether they are traumatic, uh, whether they are, um, I guess, kind of big T traumatic or little T traumatic. So it kind of depends. But for all of the things that people are dealing with, um, I, I kind of like to kind of give those those skills and those tidbits. So let me uh, just kind of talk about some of the, uh, the themes that I have noticed uh, since then. So the first is grief. So probably not a big surprise. There was an article that came out, I believe, is in the Wall Street Journal uh, in, I believe it was March of 2020. And it was written by, uh, grief, actually it wasn't written by, it was, it was uh, quoting uh, grief expert David Kessler. And he talked about how the, the weirdness that we were feeling was grief. And that was the grief over, over many types of losses. So we have death losses and we have non-death losses. So when the pandemic started, we had, you know, just a lot of kind of things up in the air. We had a lot of changes going on and really people were, were struggling with, um, so many different things. And um, what I have noticed over time is that um, people are, are struggling to move through grief in ways that feel um, like, like the grief is, is moving forward and completing. Um, and often people are experiencing additional losses on top of what they've already experienced. Like, like I said, whether those are death uh, losses or non-death losses. So non-death losses can be things like, like I experienced loss of income, um, you know, people, the, the loss of independence, loss of um, autonomy, um, just loss of freedoms, things like that. There's just so many different things. I know, uh, you know, a lot of uh, parents working at home and having their kids at home uh, for school and then just kind of mandates were back and forth with kids returning to school. So there's just so many different losses that have kind of come up that have been um, different and new and very challenging for a lot of people. Um, and those things, you know, have kind of calmed down. But what I've noticed is that there's still this undercurrent of grief that's happening with a lot of people. And like I said, there's like one loss after another. And, and it doesn't necessarily um, mean that each loss is, it, we, we kind of take it in the same way or experience it in the same way because grief is such a, a very personal thing and we don't necessarily know how we're going to be affected by a loss until it's right there in our face. Um, but, but I have talked to so many people who are just really struggling with having one thing after another and feeling like they can't catch their breath. So I've noticed that. But there's this, that, like I said, this underlying current um, where grief is kind of running in the background. And, we, and, and of course, not only the pandemic, but so many other things have happened um, on a worldwide level, uh, as well as in our country here in the United States and uh, locally and regionally as well. So just thinking about all the things that have happened, all the news that we've been exposed to, and there's just this kind of grief that is happening and people are really struggling with that. And what I've noticed is that kind of leads to my second theme, which is burnout. And, whew, you know, I kind of have this scale of like, how crunchy are you on the burnout scale? And, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's, pretty real out there. You know, when, when the pandemic started, a lot of our healthcare workers um, were really struggling. Obviously, they were overtaxed, overburdened. There were not enough resources to support them. Um, I also was blessed to uh, do on-site work about a year into the pandemic and going into hospitals and working with frontline healthcare workers as they were dealing with the intensity of the pandemic. So um, I got to see that firsthand and how their burnout, like 
they just did not have time to deal with it. And that's often um, how things go when we have a lot of, of things that are going on and we're really focused in on um, the work that we're doing the impact that we're having and we kind of put ourselves on that back burner and uh, when we do that we're just trying to get through you know trying to make it through um, cope with the what the task at the ha at hand um, and then it's it's this delayed reaction so people in my profession we know like we saw this coming um, as soon as the pandemic started we knew that once people started to like not people, but just all the, you know, the things started to calm down a little bit, I guess is the best way to say that we knew that, that the, the mental health issues were going to kind of rise up. And that's what we're seeing now is we're seeing a lot of increase in, in things like grief and anxiety and depression um, that are kind of running rampant right now. We kind of call it the, um, the, what well, you know, the healthcare crisis was the pandemic, and now we're kind of in that aftermath of the mental health crisis um, right now. And people are, are really struggling with emotions, and there's just a lot more complication um, and more challenging emotions that we're seeing uh, where people are trying to deal with um, the idea of holding space for two often conflicting emotions at the same time. And that can be a challenge. So what I've done is, you know, having these themes of grief and burnout um, really early on uh, three years ago, right after the pandemic started, I, I started um, working, doing a lot of consulting work, uh, and I, I kind of coined this term of self-care on steroids. And this is a kind of a four-step model that I teach on, on how do we kind of look at our self-care now that you know, things are not necessarily working that the way that they were. And that's kind of a, another theme of what I've seen is that people's routines are just not working in the same ways. Like even if we had things kind of set up um, in a certain way, we have kind of our autopilot mode and, and these routines that we have. And when, when I'm talking about self-care, I'm really talking about how do we uh, manage our, our mind, our body, and our soul. So all the kind of different components uh, to self-care. And it, they just kind of like some things kind of went out the window there for a while. Um, and maybe they still are. I don't know. It just depends, right? Um, so I'm going to just kind of go over these four steps, um, just the things that I teach people on how to kind of look at self-care and what can be really helpful um, as you're kind of moving through this undercurrent of grief and burnout. So one is looking at what is working. So often we have routines in place that we've had in place for a really long time, and we just do them on autopilot. And so we want to really take a look at what is working because we, we tend to forget, you know, if it's on autopilot, we're not consciously thinking about it. And therefore it's really, really easy to forget that that is something that is supporting us in taking care of ourselves. So, figuring out what is working. So really thinking about it. So maybe from the time you get up in the morning, like, what am I doing? What am I, you know, what are the hygiene habits that I have? What are the nutrition and the health and the, and the movement and, and other types of self-care routines that are working well? And I'm also going to say that I'm a big proponent of writing things down. So I don't know if you could tell, but I'm a middle-aged woman. And so I'm in that stage where like, it's hard to remember things sometimes, um, but I'm also a busy professional. So that's another way that I'm really, it's hard to remember. So kind of that double whammy. So I always tell people like, if I don't write it down, I'm not gonna remember. And even if I do write it down, I still may not remember. So that's kind of my little inside joke. Uh, but I will say it can be really helpful to write this stuff down. So writing down what is working, within your self-care routines. And then the next thing um, in this four-step model, so number two, is what is not working. So what is not working? Just kind of thinking about, the, these are the things that I've done for a long time, but this just isn't working. And maybe it's something that we abandoned. Maybe it's a routine that was working for a really long time and we stopped doing it. We stopped doing it consistently. Uh, but just taking a look at those things and then write those down as well. 
Step three is what needs to be changed. So thinking about maybe something that isn't working as well. So it's, it, sometimes we want to just kind of abandon it, right? Like, oh, if it's not working, I'm just going to not do it anymore. Um, but maybe we just need to tweak it a little bit. So what are the things that we need to work on? What's something that we can do a little bit differently within that routine? Um, it could be looking at like, is this the best time of day for this to happen? Is this the best day of the week for this to happen? Is this, um, do I have enough time to do this? Am I feeling um, energized when I do this? Am I feeling depleted? Are there people, do I need support in doing this? So just kind of examining what are little ways that you can kind of tweak it to make it work a little bit better to see if it still will work and that you can kind of add that back in uh, to your routine. Um, one thing uh, that I also like to say with uh, what needs to be changed is um, that we, you know, like I said, we can kind of abandon those things and uh, we, we really don't uh, want to do that. We really want to kind of figure out what what things can be really helpful to um and to, to just take a look at. I'm sorry, just totally lost my train of thought there. So I'm going to just move on to step four. Uh, so what needs to be added? So this is where, you know, we've got the things that we know that work. We have things that we have abandoned that maybe we've tweaked a little bit. Um, and then now what can be added? And this is the real big thing uh, that I've been teaching people is like, what are the new things to try? So this might be something, it could be something that you abandoned a long time ago and you want to start it up again, um, but it could be something that you've been wanting to try for a long time. Uh, so thinking about that, again, kind of writing those things down. Um, and then I'm going to kind of go into some of the, the what I call the key ingredients uh, when we are talking about resiliency. And these are the things that really helped me at the beginning of the pandemic as well. Uh, so the first is gratitude. Uh, and gratitude can be a little tricky because sometimes we're not in the right frame of mind for that and we need some other kind of pre-work before we can get there. Um, but gratitude, being really grateful for the things that we have, I know that was tremendously supportive for me um, at the beginning of the pandemic because even though I lost a lot of my income, um, I still was okay. You know, things were still, things were still good. Uh, the second ingredient is mindfulness. And this is a wonderful, wonderful tool. Um, you may be familiar with it. Uh, definitely uh, a game changer. Uh, so mindfulness is really about being aware in the present moment, intentionally without judgment. And there's different ways to practice mindfulness. There's the formal practice of when you are being led through it or you're leading yourself through the practice of mindfulness where we might be focusing in on our breath. We might be focusing in on our body. And then there's also the informal practice, which is how do we bring mindfulness into our everyday living? And so I practice um, based on mindfulness-based stress reduction, MBSR, which was created by John Kabat-Zinn. Uh, so just a, a little tidbit there if you want to look him up. Um, and then the last ingredient that I have been teaching even more than ever before in the last three years is self-compassion. I've seen a lot of how people have been treating each other over the last three years. And what I know to be true is that most people that I have ever worked with or known in my life are compassionate. They have a lot of compassion and empathy for others. A lot of people, not everybody, but a lot of people, especially entrepreneurs and people who work to help and serve other people. But we often forget to have compassion for ourselves. So we really want to shift and kind of look at how are we being compassionate towards others and how can we now mirror that back to ourselves in order to give ourselves a little compassionate break. And Kristen Neff, Dr. Kristen Neff and Dr. Christopher Germer are my go-tos for self-compassion work. Um, and they have a lot of great audios online and activities online, um, both free. And then they also have other, other products that they sell, um, which can be really a, a great entry point for doing some self-compassion work. So I got through it in 20 minutes, <laughs> but I just wanted to 
to just kind of lay out some of the things I've observed over the last three years. And, and hopefully some of that's helpful. That is amazing. and <laughs> Awesome. Thank you. And, you know, the self-compassion, self-care piece is critical right now. It's always been critical, but it becomes more so, especially, you know, when you're in a stressful phase of life, whatever's causing that stress. Mm, yes, definitely. Absolutely. Thank you for an amazing talk. Thank you, everybody who is watching. Let's please give Creelin a huge round of applause, a thank you and appreciation for doing an amazing job. Thank you. I am so grateful you are here today. Y'all, let's give her a standing ovation, please. And with that, we're going to